Welcome back to our seminar on spiritual warfare. We've been talking about the glorious victory of Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the champion. Having embraced the cross, shed his blood and died a sinner's death, justice was satisfied once and for all. And so the grave could not hold him because he was innocent. And he rose from the dead as a victor. And as a result, his name is exalted above every name that is mentioned in heaven and on earth, the name of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 on through 11, it says in verse 10, it says that, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, that says so much, the precious name of Jesus. You see, that's what's on that power of attorney. It's not our name, it's Jesus' name. So the victory that he won, all that he has, his whole inheritance, who he is, has now been given to us. And we can, in his name, do his work. We can undo the works of the enemy. We can bind up the strong man. We can expel demons. We have access to the Father in the name of Jesus. We can ask anything in his name. Precious name of Jesus. I think we need to understand how to use this. Never take that name in vain. Never despise or flippantly use the name of Jesus. It needs to be revered and respected at all times. It's interesting that uh, uh, when Mark finishes his gospel, he, he brings forth the, the commission as we see in other of the gospels, especially in Matthew, but he puts a new twist to it. And he recounts, uh, he, he uses a phrase, those who believe in my name, they will. And then we have, they will cast out demons. They will heal the sick. They will speak in tongues. They will, <laughs> in the name of Jesus, we will do his works. Because it's the precious name of Jesus that the, uh, that the enemy understands and fears. It's those who use his name, those who have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus, have Jesus now in their lives, they can use his name and the enemy recognizes that authority. Some years ago, when I was pastoring in a small country church in Missouri, a little south of Kansas City, it's what we call Hurricane Alley, or Tornado Alley, I'm sorry. Tornado Alley, because it was so frequently the storms during the summer would create those, uh, those tornadoes and they'd be so destructive. Well, one time a tornado hit down and it uh, had destroyed the barn and part of the house of one of the members of our church. When I found out about that, I ran over there to help them get their cows and put in, uh, because it was milking time, to get them to another neighbor and and try to help them with the disaster. It was a disaster. And then all of a sudden, another tornado was lifting up and we could see it coming right toward us. And as it was approaching the fence, I just looked at it and I said, in the name of Jesus, lift out of here and go. And at that time, the, the tornado lifted up over that fence and just kind of like bounced over the top of us and then continued on its way. I'd never seen such a manifestation of the power of God and it was only because of using that name, the name of Jesus, that even nature obeys. And I, be I, I believe we need to understand a little bit about this. Some um, some have made a distinction, oh, it shouldn't be Jesus, we should use the Hebrew name Yeshua. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk about that and a lot of controversy. Uh, the word Yeshua is the same word as Joshua, 
in the, in the Old Testament, same word, Yeshua. It means sal salvation, Savior. And of course, it's a very important name. Uh, I have no problem using it. But we have to understand how it became Jesus is a more of a phonetical uh, development rather than an actual theological decision. You see, the, uh, the early church used Yeshua. And then later on, uh, it began to be um, pronounced, especially as the church became more Gentile, and not Hebrew, they didn't understand the Hebrew language, so it became Yesus, Yesus, instead of Yeshua. And then later on in the 1500s, the, because they had no J at that point in the language, in the Latin languages. So Yesus became, uh, and then they had to make a distinction between an I and a J because of the, of the development of the language and and so they put a tail on the eye to make it ye or je in, in Spanish is ye in, uh, in Portuguese is je and in, in uh, English is je and so it um, they had to make a distinction of the sound they put a tail on the eye to make it a j sound je, Jesus or Jesus or uh, Jesus, as it was developed, language is always fluid. It's not; it doesn't stay static. It changes from century to century and from place to place. So uh, it's really no big deal because you use the name of Jesus or Yeshua or Jesus or whatever language you want to use, they understand, the enemy understands that name and bows its knee to that name. Uh, tied to the name of Jesus is the name Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Some people think Christ is his last name, but no, it's not his last name. Christ is the, uh, Christus in, in Greek, Christ is the uh, equivalent to Messiah in the Hebrew. So is Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the Christ? It means the anointed one. And then Lord, so you have Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting that the early church baptized people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Lord mean, you know, uh, mean a creator, Lord of all, he's the owner. Everything that the earth belongs to the Lord. In fact, that word Lord is the most commonly used word in all of scriptures. It's, it's there over 5,000 times, the word Lord. And it's the most common reference to God there is. Lord, because he is the owner, he is the ruler, he is Lord of all. Lord, we can say Father, Jesus, the Son, Christ, the Holy Spirit. So we have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all in this name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I just want us to realize when we use the word Jesus, it's really packed. It is really full of the whole of the Godhead. That's why it's such a powerful name. It's important to to identify not just with the Son, Jesus, but also the Father, the Lord, Jesus. We submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus. In other words, that he is the ruler, he is the King of kings and Lord of all. And so when we call him Lord, it is a position of submission. We come under that. We recognize his right to rule. We recognize that he knows best. We recognize that he is the truth and the only way. So we, uh, uh, so we can't put ourselves on an equal basis. We can't treat that in a um, mundane fashion. We must see that this is powerful because it is, it is, it is our identification with him as the Lord of our lives. When Moses was sent to deliver um, uh, the people from, uh, from Israel, uh, from Egypt, 
And he was on the mountain and God confronted him with this commission. And he says, you go and set my people free. And, uh, and Moses said, well, what's your name? And God revealed his name this way. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is my name. That's in Exodus uh, chapter 6. We see this chapter in verse 3. We see that he is revealed in a generational way. He's revealed not just in a singular, but in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We, we see there's a constant threesome in, in reference to God in the scriptures when he reveals himself to us. Lordship is really the source of all conflict uh, here on earth because it challenges those that have wanted to own them their own lives. <laughs> and go their own way. It's a challenge. It's a conflict, but it's also a comfort because there we can relax, realizing that he knows best and he can guide us into the way of blessing and prosperity. Now, we, uh, we have a very precious relationship when we use that word Jesus. It talks about relationship. It talks about his intimacy with us. It talks about he is coming in because those who are in Christ and Christ is in them are heirs of eternal life. So when we use the name of Jesus, we're not talking about someone so far away. He's right there. We need to honor him because we are Christ bearers. We, we have Christ in us. Some people, the only Christ they'll see is when they look at us. We are a book <laughs> read by all. So we need to allow the life of Jesus to come forth from us. And when we use that name, we use it specifically in doing his will. I praise God for the name of Jesus. I've seen so many people healed just through using the name of Jesus. It's not because that's a magic formula. It's a person. And when we use the name of Jesus to heal, when we lay our hands and we pray in the name of Jesus, it's this, it's this that on our hands is the hand of the Lord. As we place our hand, he places his hand. As we speak out the words, he's speaking out the words because it's a relationship that is tied to the name. We are in Christ, Christ is in us. When we use his name as that power of attorney, it has just as much authority as if Jesus were standing there using or speaking out those words. It is the precious name of Jesus. I want us to stop uh, kicking against the pricks. Stop using his name in a benign way, in a way that would dishonor him. Don't swear using the word name of Jesus. Don't use it in frustration. Don't use it as an exclamation point or a way to emphasize or even show how spiritual you are. No. Use it as God has directed you to use it. Use it against the enemy to place the enemy under your feet so that you can rule and reign in this life as ambassadors of the King of Kings. Lord bless.